All right, tonight's study, Lord willing, study called Swept and Garnished. And we'll take a look at the parable of the unclean spirit that we find in Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 43. Uh, we'll look at the casting out of the spirit, first of all. What does it mean? Is this pointing to the salvation or the redemption of the body? of Christ, right? Let me go ahead and post the first verse. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. What does it mean, first of all, to cast out a spirit? Anyone? When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, Could this be looking at the individual salvation of the believers? Let me get the other part of this verse. In verse 43, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. When does the unclean spirit, what is the unclean spirit, first of all? That would have to be pointing to Satan, right? the unclean spirit, the devil, and his angels. And what about the man? Is this talking about yourself, myself? Does this mean that if someone does become saved, and then later on we're going to read about the, the unclean spirit coming back into this man? In uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. Can you see how the casting out of a spirit, uh, even though historically that did happen, Christ, it seems, he literally uh, cast out devils from those who were possessed? But that in itself appeared to have been a picture of salvation. When someone does become saved, it's as if uh, God has removed them from the kingdom of darkness and brought them into the, the kingdom of Christ. But I think we're going to find, Lord willing, that the timing of this the timing of this is not so much when the individual becomes saved, but rather when the body itself, the church, is redeemed. God brings the believers out of tribulation. That too, you know, just like everything else that we've seen, is pointing to, it, it's, it's referring to uh, the redemption, the salvation of the body of Christ. So that's the timing here I propose. I think we're going to be looking at the Great Tribulation. And then when Christ is revealed after the Tribulation. Now notice here in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 8. When the even was come. That I think is a clue. What is this pointing to? The evening or the even. Remember the night cometh when no man can work. What happens at night? What happens at night? There is darkness, right? Darkness comes at night, and the darkness of God allowing the false prophets, the false Christ, Antichrist, to rule in the church, in the body of Christ. It is spiritually nighttime. It is the even. So when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. So the believers, they too, they are said to be in spiritual darkness coming into the Great Tribulation, and then when Christ is revealed, He is going to cast out, right? That doesn't mean that the individuals themselves were not saved, but rather as a body, corporately, when God separates the wheat from the tares, that too is salvation. So God is casting out, God is pouring out the Holy Spirit a second time, so that now the believers, they begin to understand time and judgment. Okay, so he cast out the other uh, spirits. Here's another verse. Acts chapter 16, verse 18. 
And there again, I think the timing is, is very important. Uh, and I commanded, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. Now this is Paul, right? Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, uh, right here he is casting out a, an evil spirit from, from someone. And notice here that it's the same hour. What is the hour pointing to spiritually? The day and the hour. The day and the hour. It's important I think we understand this as I said because uh, it does bring us into the judgment of God on the church, on the body of Christ. So he is going to cast out this devil the same hour. The hour cometh when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. That's the great tribulation. What about Mark chapter 5 verse 2? And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. I think it's interesting here that God says he has come out of the ship. The ship, spiritually, I think, is pointing to what? What do you suppose the ship might be pointing to? Any clue? Wouldn't the ship also be typifying the church? Yeah. So coming out of the ship, it seems, might be relating to God the Holy Spirit being taken out. God the Holy Spirit is removed from the midst. Notice that it's the time that he comes out of the ship. Now he is faced with uh, someone from the tomb, a man with an unclean spirit. That, I think, again... Lord willing, would have to be spiritually pointing to the body of Christ. And then he is going to cast out, that is, redeem, save the church, the elect, to bring them out of Babylon. Mark chapter 5, verse 8. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Thou unclean spirit. And in Acts chapter 16, we saw here that it's the same hour. So I think the timing of it uh, would be the great tribulation. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. <clears throat> Anytime someone becomes saved, they've been taken out of the dominion of darkness. Individually, as God is sealing the 144,000, that is salvation. Uh, God is going to cast out the devils. He brings them out of darkness to bring them into light. And then also, as I said, corporately, as an entity, when the church comes into the great tribulation, there too God is going to cast out. He is going to bind Satan so that he would let the prisoners free. And when that happens, then the kingdom of God is come. Because now the church, the believers, they identify with Christ. They come into the new heavens and the new earth. And then uh, one other verse. Now that's why, you know, it's important today we're told that we have to try the spirits. First John chapter 4 verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because... Many false prophets are gone out into the world. So try the spirits. I think we're going to see a little bit further. Even though God speaks of casting out the spirits, casting out the devils, I think ultimately this parable is another way of looking at Lot's wife. Those who come out, they come close to the kingdom, they give evidence of salvation. But in reality, they fall away. They go right back into the old ways. Okay, so we have to try the spirits. Any questions in this section here, looking at casting out the spirits? And as I said, the, the timing of it, Lord willing, would be when God is uh, judging the church and bringing the believers out of Babylon. Okay, so let's go back to... Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. We're going to look at seeking death. 
in verse 43, <clears throat> excuse me, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. What does it mean to seek rest? Who is the rest that the believers have to enter in? That they have to enter into? Yeah, it is Christ. Exactly, Greg. Christ is the rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. So, now the unclean spirit. Now, you know, it's interesting. You know, Keep in mind that God here, I believe, he is... Uh, first of all, giving us a picture of salvation, and then he takes away the salvation. This, uh, this individual here apparently is giving evidence of salvation because the devil or an evil spirit has been cast out of the man. Now the man there spiritually, I believe it is pointing to the church. God is corporately redeeming the church, just like, you know, in the Old Testament he speaks of even the unsaved in the church, they too, they are said to be redeemed, and then they fall away. So God cares corporately for the whole body. All right, Amos chapter 8, verse 12. They shall wander from sea to sea, uh, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. That could only be a time of tribulation. And then it transitions into the judgment on Babylon. Right again. Hi, welcome to the room. Looking at a Bible study, uh, looking at the, the parable of the unclean spirit, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. And Amos chapter 8, verse 12. They shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. To seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Well, there's only one time really when God would speak of a famine coming on the church. When does that happen? Does that come at the very end of the world, the very last day? I don't think so, right? God brings a famine of hearing the word of, of Christ, the word of God. In other words, when the church comes into the great tribulation, that's a form of judgment. Uh, but the believers, they still had to come out of Babylon. They still had to be redeemed from this famine. Just like, you know, Joseph back in the land of Egypt his brothers came to him for redemption. They came seeking bread. And he represented Christ. Uh, can you hold that question uh, after the study will open uh, for general comments? Okay. And then, uh, yeah, I just want to get through some verses here. If you have a question regarding the study, I'll be happy to, you know, take a look at it because I have the verses ready. No, no, it's not a problem. Uh, just a reminder, a general reminder. Uh, we'll open up uh, after the study uh, for a general discussion. Okay, so they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Notice, notice how similar this is with uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. This unclean spirit is seeking rest. What about Revelation 9, verse 6? And in those days shall men see death. What death are they seeking? In those days shall men see death and shall not find it. And shall desire to die. Now keep in mind that God here is speaking in parables, right? So we have to look for the spiritual meaning. We have to look for the gospel. Yeah, it is the death of... Yeah, to be buried with Christ. Exactly, Greg. It is the death of salvation, the death of the righteous. Let me die the death of the righteous. So they are seeking death in a time of famine. They are seeking rest. They are seeking Christ, seeking salvation, and there is none. Why? Well, because it's nighttime. The night cometh when no man can work. In the nighttime, again, I don't think it's pointing to the very last day. It has to do with God unleashing the false prophets 
false Christ. They begin to multiply in the body of Christ. And that's a form of judgment. God gives them over. And then in Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, same thing I believe is in view. Now this is post-tribulation, after Christ is revealed. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Again, day and night here I think is pointing to God's judgment on the church, the great tribulation. So they have no rest, they're seeking death, they're seeking rest, they're seeking salvation, and there is none. But you know what's interesting though is that God, first of all, he speaks of the unclean spirit coming out of the man. And that would seem to be pointing to salvation. <clears throat> and yet, God speaks of this unclean spirit now going back into the same man. Well, how is that possible? Returning to the house. And as I said before, I think this is another way of looking at Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. When God was destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, God told them to flee to the mountains, do not look back. The mountains there, I believe, is pointing to the kingdom of God. They are forsaking Babylon. They're forsaking the church. And they're not supposed to turn back. And then she turned back, and what happened? What happened to Lot's wife? When she turned and looked back, she became what? A pillar of salt. Yeah, exactly, Radigan. And that's a picture of judgment coming on Lot's wife. And she is a picture, I believe, of all those in the body of Christ, the churches and congregations, corporately identifying with the church. And now God is giving, He is uh, providing more information in terms of knowledge and understanding. Uh, what's happening at the time when God is judging the church and they're not to turn back they're not to go back into the house and what happens if they do well they're now they're giving evidence that they had never become saved same thing I believe is in view with this man first the evil spirit is cast out and then now he is going to go back right Matthew chapter 12 verse 44 then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Now we're going to look at this language here, swept and garnished. Uh, but the this unclean spirit is going to go back into the same house. Right? The church uh, corporately or spiritually is possessed by uh, the unclean spirit. Green eyes. All right, welcome back. The church is possessed by the unclean spirit. Uh, the unclean spirit is cast out. Doesn't mean that the person becomes saved. And then God speaks of the unclean spirit going back into the house. Look at the language of Luke chapter 17, verse 31. In that day. What day is that? Is this talking about the very last day? He which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house. What house? The local churches? No, I don't think that that's what's in view. The house of God is a, uh, a corporate body of people, a, a collection, uh, a gathering. So this house here, spiritually, I think, again, it is pointing to the, uh, the church. Not necessarily the local churches and congregations, but rather the, uh, the corporate church, the body of Christ. Now, the idea of having the stuff in the house doesn't mean you're going back inside the local church, but rather one is going back to the old doctrines, the old gospels. They're not receiving understanding. They're not receiving revelation. And now they go back into the old ways. And that was typified, as I said, I believe, uh, by Lot's wife. She is looking back. She is drawing back onto perdition. So his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, uh, let him likewise not return back. So Lot's wife, again, I believe, is in view here. 
uh, hold on one second. Luke chapter 17, verse 32. There it is. Remember Lot's wife. So in the context of God judging Babylon, in the context of God judging the church, he reminds us of Lot's wife who gave evidence of someone being saved because she is taken out of the city and then she looks back. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 39 But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. And when we read about drawing back, it begins with the great tribulation. There's a great falling away. And then God now, Christ is revealed. The Bible is unsealed. God gives a general knowledge, a general understanding, I believe, of the end of the church age. That doesn't mean that because someone left the church that they became saved necessarily. So these might be uh, giving evidence. You know, they might be uh, looking at uh, what happened with Lot's wife. John chapter 5 verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in a temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, what, what do you suppose is wrong with this picture here? In John chapter 5, verse 14. If Christ says to him, Thou art made whole, doesn't, wouldn't this imply salvation? If someone is made whole, doesn't it mean that they have become saved? And if that's the case, why would he say, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee? Does this mean that if you and I sin after we become saved, then somehow we are going to lose that salvation? Is that possible? No. That's not possible. Why? Well, because when Christ made payment for the sins of the elect, it was already accounted for. It was already predetermined from the foundation of the world. So God is not looking at how faithful you are going to keep the physical law, the Ten Commandments. Christ is the one who kept the laws on behalf of the elect. So once someone does become saved, they are truly sealed and they cannot lose their salvation. Otherwise, salvation would be based on the work that we do. But nonetheless, we read here that the man is made whole, and then Christ says, sin no more. It doesn't seem to add up, right? It doesn't mean that if you sin now, you something worse is going to happen. So we have to try and find the gospel, right? We have to try and find the gospel. Afterward, Jesus findeth them in a temple, said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Now, corporately, the church... Even before the Great Tribulation, before God's judgment on the body of Christ, the church has been made whole. Why? Well, because it is now identified corporately with Christ. Just like the, the people when they came out of the land of Egypt, God cared for all of them. He fed them in the wilderness. He cared for them. <clears throat> but that in itself doesn't mean that every single one who came out of the land of Egypt had become saved. So the idea of making someone whole, I propose, it has to do with uh, corporate salvation. They identify with the body of Christ, but if now they become Lot's wife, now they give evidence that they had never truly become saved, then something worse is going to happen to them. And what is that? It is the fact that they now draw back onto perdition. They come into the second death, the lake of fire. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. If we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Does that make sense? Now how can someone, how can someone sin willfully after they have received the knowledge of the truth? Now when we understand, uh, looking at the rest of the Bible, that salvation is not active on the part of the believer but rather passive you and I you know there's nothing we can do to get ourselves saved so it has to do God has to do the work altogether 
So someone receives the knowledge of the truth, they're said to be made whole, they're not necessarily saved. And that's true individually as well as corporately as God is separating the wheat from the tares. Now notice in uh, 2 Peter 2, 21, 4, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So there again, someone turning from the holy covenant or the holy commandment, it would mean that they never did become saved. But nonetheless, they are said to have known the way of righteousness. They've tasted the good word of God, but now they fall away. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. I think we see a similar uh, passage here. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And that's an ugly picture, right? The dog returning to its own vomit. That's the church, I propose, going back to the old ways. They're not keeping the uh, the commandments. They're not keeping the law of God because God is not giving them revelation, not giving them the understanding. Now they become Lot's wife. And then in verse 20 of 2 Peter chapter 2, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome the latter end is worse than is worse with them than the beginning interesting language here the latter end and notice again that they have escaped the pollutions of the world they never did become saved for God so loved the world corporately God it seems he is caring for the church as long as God Christ is in the midst but then when God brings judgment to the church, the great tribulation, we start reading about the falling away. Now keep an eye on this verse here. We're going to come back to the uh, this idea, the latter end, which I think again has to do with perdition, the second death, separation of wheat and tares. Uh, Matthew 27 verse 64. You know what? Let me take this verse out. This verse is saying something similar, but uh, I believe it's in a different context. I thought I had removed that verse. Maybe some other time we'll, we'll come back and, and look at that verse. But in the meantime, look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 45. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits. Now we're still looking at the unclean spirit. First, the unclean spirit comes out of the man. And then it is seeking rest, it is seeking salvation, it finds none, and now decides to go back into the man. I will return to my house from whence I came. And then when the unclean spirit returns, he finds it swept and garnished. But notice here in uh, Matthew 12, verse 45, Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Can you see that? Compare that to, uh, with 2 Peter 2 verse 20. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So this I believe, again, it's talking about someone who has known the knowledge of the truth, known the way of righteousness. They are made whole. So corporately, they identify with Christ. That's the church. I am the vine, you are the branches. But now they return. The dog returns to its own vomit. Now they are once again entangled with the things of the world. In other words, they're going back to the old ways. Now the latter end. In other words, God now is going to cast them into the lake of fire. And once they are there, there is no more redemption. There is no more salvation. So the latter end is going to be worse than the beginning. Can you see that? So the last state of that man is worse than the first. And the Bible has a very uh, basic principle, I believe. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. The first, the church. The firstborn, 
now because uh, you know just like Esau the church sold its birthright for a bowl of soup and now it is said to be last the latter end is worse than the first okay any questions so far we're gonna move into the uh, verse 44 swept and garnished false prophets is that surprising now this unclean spirit has gone out of the man in other words this is a man who knew the knowledge of the way of Christ identified corporately with the church and now the spirit has been cast out it goes out of the man but now because it never did become saved the individual never did become saved <clears throat> just like Lot's wife <clears throat> it is going back to the old ways so the unclean spirit goes back into the man and then he finds it swept and garnished um, I'll remove the red dot if you stay in the room and uh, you know decide to have a conversation <clears throat> All right, so Matthew chapter 12, verse 44. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Now, of course, we have to search the Bible, right? We have to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Titus chapter 2, verse 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine see the idea of adorning I think it has to do with doctrine and there is the doctrine of Christ but there is also the doctrine of Antichrist Matthew 23 29 woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous in other words, they on the outside they appear to be clean, they appear to be uh, holy, but they are sheep and wolf. Uh, they are wolves. I'm sorry, in sheep's clothing. So woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. They kill the believers. They kill the elect, and they garnish their sepulchres. Luke 21 verse 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. All those who identified corporately with Christ. Now that, uh, that temple there, I think it is pointing to the church. It is pointing to the body of Christ. But Christ here is uh, prophesying that there would come a time not one stone would be left upon another. So in other words, God was going to destroy this temple. Remember that? destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up so the church is uh, comes under the wrath of God but because the elect the believers are given uh, a revelation so they stand upon their feet they are resurrected the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down and that's where we are today I believe Isaiah chapter 14, verse 23. I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the bittern of destruction. So the idea of sweeping seems to be pointing to God's judgment. Sweeping it with the bittern of destruction, the bittern or bissom. And then we read... Uh, in Isaiah chapter 28 verse 17 judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies refuge of lies so there it is again I believe God brings judgment to Babylon he is doing away uh, with the false prophets he is uh, destroying them sweeping them away sweeping away the refuge of lies and you put that together with the, the Pharisees, the uh, Sadducees typifying uh, the unsaved in the, in, in the body of Christ. They garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. All of it, again, I, I believe has to do with uh, false gospel. Judges chapter 5, verse 21, the river of Kishon, that's a, a river in Palestine, 
swept them away. God uses the wicked to destroy the wicked. So it is the wicked that is sweeping away the wicked through the activities of God. God is uh, allowing this to take place as a form of judgment. Okay, any questions? We got one last section to look at. And this is the idea of seven other spirits being more wicked than, than himself. There again, I think we're looking at Satan going into perdition. Let me post this verse again. Matthew chapter 12, verse 45. I have to break it up. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. You see, the, the last state, I think this is telling us of the first shall be last, the last shall be first. The church was first in a sense that they had, uh, uh, they identified with Christ. But because the church falls away, now the church has become last. <clears throat> uh, and the believers, they were said to be last, but now they have become first. Now, seven, the number seven here, I think, is pointing to the Great Tribulation. It's a number that identifies uh, with judgment and tribulation. And we can also see salvation there, depending on the context. So seven other spirits, I think, is pointing to the revelation of Christ when God is judging Babylon. Right? It's not really the number. We have to look at the context, Lord willing. Because this is a time when God, as Christ is revealed, and he binds Satan, and now the last state is worse than the first. That's the lake of fire. Matthew 19, verse 30, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now, I mentioned here that the number seven could be pointing to salvation, and I think this might be one of them. Luke chapter 8, verse 2, And certain women which have been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Now the idea of casting out the devils, that's the language of salvation. But we, when we compare that to the rest of the Bible, we can have someone like this man possessed by an evil spirit, having the evil spirit cast out in a sense that there's a, in a sense that there's a general a knowledge or understanding of the time but then if the evil spirits are going to go back into the church into the unsaved in the church now they are cast into the lake of fire isn't that interesting um, in Revelation chapter 16 verse 14 now these spirits if they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That battle, again, I believe would be uh, the time when Christ is revealed. Okay, Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold. And number two, we've talked about this before. I think, uh, given the context, the number two has a lot to say about the second death. Remember that? Double unto her according to her works. That's Babylon. The number two pointing to God's judgment on the church. And I think God is using the, the word twofold here to point to the fact that ultimately God is going to destroy spiritually the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all the unsaved in the body, the false prophets. Now, this is what I... Uh, I was pointing to before. I will therefore, Jude chapter 1 verse 5, put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, after having saved, or having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, Egypt typified the church. It typified wickedness, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. So the idea of coming out of Sodom, coming out of Egypt, is salvation. But even though God corporately, it seems, He allows for a general understanding of this salvation, nevertheless, 
Uh, he continues to purge the body. He's separating the wheat from the tares. And those who did not truly become saved, they become Lot's wife. They are like this man who has the devil come back. The devil has gone out, but then now the devil comes back and finds the house swept and garnished. Pointing to the fact that I believe that it is under the wrath of God. Right? It is swept and garnished with lies. Okay, so having saved the people, now, you know, you can't be saved and then be destroyed at the same time. So can you see how salvation could also be pointing to someone who is not truly saved, but yet God speaks of them as having been saved anyway, right? That's true individually, as I said, and I believe it's also true when we look at the, uh, the redemption of the body. And then finally... Revelation chapter 17, verse 11. That's a challenging verse. We've looked at it before. I'll just, uh, you know, briefly comment on it. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Satan was, he is ruling at the start of the great tribulation, and Christ is revealed, the deadly wound is healed. So this beast is no more. The believers, they are healed, they're coming out. They're separated from the beast. And then now God is going to allow the, that unsaved portion of the body who is of the seven. In other words, this is uh, the church. We're looking at the church in judgment, in tribulation. And now it is going into perdition. That's where the evil spirits comes back. So that the last state of this man, of the church, is worse than the first. So he is of the seven and go within to perdition, the second death. All right, let me go ahead and post, uh, I'll post the conclusion on here and then we'll open for a discussion. There it is. Parable of Matthew 12, 43 to 45 seems to be pointing to Lot's wife. You know, that's not surprising. God, I think, has a, a number of ways of giving us the same picture different language different scenario it's like taking a picture from uh, different angles you see it from different vantage points so here again I, I think this parable is pointing to uh, Lot's wife um, so corporately the body is said to be saved that is the unclean spirit is cast out both during the church age as well as after the tribulation. However, the unsaved in the church, the unsaved in the body, may give evidence of salvation, and then eventually they are destroyed when God allows more wicked spirits to rule in the unsaved body. That makes sense, right? Okay. Uh, hold on one second. 